Hello everyone and welcome to Lifestyle Denmark. Today we have Jennifer Switcher with us again, living in Florida. And she has been with us once before, sharing her very interesting testimony. And uh, we are so blessed that uh, she will uh, today and um, in the future answer some critical uh, questions uh, to different subjects in life. And today we are going to talk about the transgender issue. And um, before we start to talk about this subject, um, we are going to read a verse from the Bible, from Hebrew 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. And isn't that good that we know that we have a good Father in heaven who are not condemning us for our weaknesses, our sins, but has his arms open to us and wants us to come to him so that he can help us. We are going to uh, talk about this uh, trans transgender issue. And uh, the question is, how can um, parents uh, give a talk to their children if they just want, if they want to change their um, sex? I think this question came up in my mind because personally, I have a friend who uh, uh, have a boy. He's now 13 years old. And uh, when he was a little boy, he really wanted to be a girl. He wanted to dress like the girls and he wanted to play with the dolls like the girls. And he just wanted to be with girls. And the mother is wondering, how is she going to tackle this situation? So I'm very happy that we will get some answer on this question because I think many people, many parents today probably are asking this. But before uh, we are starting to talk about it, I would like to ask you some questions. Do you have some wounds in your life? I think we all have. All of us have some wounds from childhood. And the good news is that uh, when we come to Christ, he can heal those wounds. Um, did you have parents who moved once or more when you were a child? I never experienced that. But I would think it would be a kind of scary and also sad. Sad that I had to leave my old friends and scary for what was, uh, you know, how would uh, your friends in the new school accept you? I don't have experience with that, but Jennifer has, so she knows how to tackle that situation. Have you ever felt of different reasons you um, do, did not have the same fashion clothes which other children have or us young people have? I have never experienced that either. But Jennifer did when she came to a new school. Have you ever been mobbed in school? Well, Jennifer has been mobbed in school and she knows the wounds coming from that too. And uh, I'm sure that that is a very hard, um, you know, some hard um, problems in life to, to deal with. But she has been overcoming those wounds too. So what is really purpose in life? What is happening when you are dying? That is questions which um, was coming to um, Jennifer in life. Have you ever been accused for stealing an other girl's boyfriend just so that other people can abuse you? That must be really a terrible thing to happen to you. But, you know, Jennifer has also uh, experienced that and know which wounds which was coming from that, but the Lord has been healing those wounds too. Have you ever been accused for stealing other girl's boyfriend just so that other people can abuse you? What a terrible thing to do. You know, it's, uh, it's amazing that children can be that, uh, you know, behave in that way to each other. Have you ever seen strange and wrong behavior from a so-called Christian and decided that you don't want to have anything more to do with Christianity. Well, you know, it's a big responsibility to be a Christian. That means that we should be Christ-like. But Jennifer's experience with that, she experienced that. She saw some Christian, which did not 
behave like Christians, and she didn't want to have anything to do with Christianity. In your search for happiness in life, have you ever gone into yoga and meditation? You know, many, many people are doing that today. And that was what Jennifer also was doing. But did she find happiness there? No, she didn't find happiness. It became, she became just more confused. And um, happily enough, she came out of this uh, actually religion if you didn't know that yoga actually is a religion, she came out of yoga and uh, found Christ. Amen. What kind of souls are you having in your soul? Is it possible to have your hurts healed? Yes. I'm so thankful to the Lord myself for the wounds in my life, which God has been healing. Um, the turning point for uh, Jennifer was when she was meeting some uh, Christians and she was asking them, please tell me about the Bible. So if I can have the last picture um, back, uh, if I can have the other, um, here we are. They were answering, it's, it's like water of life. It's just satisfy your thirst and you just want more and more water in life. So that was actually one of the first things which Jennifer heard. And that really touched her heart because she loved water. She loved swimming and everything with water. So from that point, she started to search for Christianity, searching for Christ. And on the next slide, uh, in Hebrew 4.15, I'm reading. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. So he is able to help us. Um, yes, we are going to talk about the trans transgender issue today. And uh, so, um, but before doing that, let's pray. Father in heaven, with arms and saying, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy burden, and I will give you rest. Thank you, Lord, that you uh, know that we are going to talk about this uh, subject of gender today. And we are so blessed, Lord, that uh, Jennifer is going to uh, talk about this critical um, question or this issue. We pray that you will be with her and uh, and that you will be with uh, the parents, Lord, who maybe have children who are struggling in this uh, manner. We pray, Lord, for the children themselves. Uh, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you will help us to surrender fully to you and just experience that you can heal the wounds in our lives and that you can set us free for whatever we are, are uh, uh, struggling with in life. We praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I've been given the question, what should I do if my child is expressing transgender sentiments? Meaning if they're a boy, they want to be a girl. If they're a girl, they want to be a boy. Why as a parent do? So I want to give a little background to the question, a little information to sort of set things up. I want to, first of all, define transgenderism. And in order to do that, I want to distinguish it from what's called intersex or disorders of sexual development. These are very different things, but they're often conflated. They're often put in the same category. And indeed, they are both forms of sexual brokenness, where in one way or another, we are not in alignment with God's pattern in creation. Let me just give a brief synopsis of what that is. God created human beings, male and female. We are a binary race. Generally speaking, individuals are born either male or female. And that's an important issue because it's blending of male and female that conveys the image of God. God made man in his own image, male and female created he them in his image, in his image is said twice for emphasis, 
meaning this is how we see what God is like, is through the blend of the female. And the two main arenas in which that blending takes place is marriage and then within the church as we labor together for Jesus, pooling our resources as men and women, that brings forth the image of God. So both transgenderism and sex are forms of sexual gender brokenness but there are different kinds of brokenness. And the reason I want to distinguish the two is because often when we discuss transgenderism and the psychological, social, and moral and spiritual implications bound up in that issue, people will say, well, some people are born with indistinct genitalia, you know, and they'll urge that as a reason why we should not have any kind of moral boundaries on transgenderism. So let me distinguish the two. So intersex, or what are called disorders of sexual development, are cases where individuals are born, they're they're not, the differentiation process, male and female, gets confused somehow in the womb. Physical differentiation takes place within the first two months in utero as a baby develops. And it's thought that possibly Brain differentiation between male and female takes place after that, but we don't really have a lot of data on that yet. But at any rate, things can go wrong with that differentiation process, and people can be born with one of two conditions. Either their genitalia are ambiguous, they're neither male nor female in terms of genitalia, or their DNA is one sex and their genitalia is another. Those are the two main categories of disorders of sexual development or DSDs. These cases, if you take all of them together, are extremely rare. Intersex conditions afflict maybe one in 1,000 people in the population. Now, what has been done traditionally is the doctor sees that the baby is not presenting as either male or female, and they used to make the best guess possible and Whatever it seemed more to be, the doctor would surgically alter the child sometimes and the child would grow up as that sex. Now what they're doing is they're not performing any surgeries or making any decisions and they're allowing that child to grow up until they get to the age of accountability when they themselves can make their own decision. So what we're gonna see in society is occasionally that children are gonna be neither male nor female, and that's gonna subject them to bullying, uh, to social isolation and ostracism. Christian should be at the head instead of the tail of tolerance, love, and compassion toward people that are wrestling with these ginormous problems that we know nothing about. So just because an individual presents as neither male nor female, we do not need to assume that they're involved in some kind of left-wing social agenda. They were born broken sexually, and we need to have compassion for them. But I want to distinguish disorders of sexual development where there are actual physiologic changes or, or problems where the person doesn't differentiate physiologically. And I want to distinguish that from transgenderism, where the individual is, generally speaking, born with completely distinct sex features, either male or female, but psychologically they come to the place where they want to be the other sex, or they even identify fully as the other sex. So disorders of sexual development, or what we call intersex, is a physiologic issue. Transgenderism is pretty much purely a psychological issue. So let's get down to where we see this presenting, oftentimes in childhood. So a child will start to identify, like your question posed, with the other sex and will want to be that other sex or even say to their parents, I am a girl in a boy's body or I am a boy in a girl's body. Actually, these kinds of things are fairly common and there are various levels of it. I remember being 10 years old. My name is Jennifer. I wanted to start identifying as a boy. And so I told everybody to call me Jeff. And I started wearing boys clothes. I just went through a phase where I 
really liked boyish things and liked being a boy. And that's very common that girls present as tomboys. Now, I realize full-blown transom is a departure from that. It's a much more extreme situation. But this kind of wrestling with gender identity is not unusual among children. And the fact is that about 85% of children who go through some kind of gender confusion as children will end up uh, transitioning out of it, <laughs> pun intended, I guess, and normalize, so to speak, as they move into adulthood. So transgender population is a very small population to begin with. It's about 0.6% of the general population from what we know, possibly higher during childhood because children go through these phases. But the vast majority of those children will transition out of wanting to be the other sex and will normalize after puberty or during puberty or sometime in their uh, maturing process. So that presents an issue. And the issue is this, that what is happening in the health field today is that certain practices are being urged upon families that to me in the long run would bring harm to children. So when it comes to transgenderism, I'm gonna back up for a moment. I do not try to urge people to do one thing or another because they have to live in that body. However, as a health provider, I have to have an opinion about, based on research, about what is good for people. So rather than come at transgender people with a moral agenda, I come at them with a health, a health agenda, if you can call it that. I, as a health provider, need to make some kind of comment about what's good for people. So I do not deny the problem of transgenderism. It's a real thing. However, I question the solution that is often presented as an easy fix to a very complex issue. The solution that is often presented is if your brain or your thinking, your identity is one sex and your body another, then change your body to conform to your psychological identity. I don't personally believe that that is the best course of action. I don't believe it's the healthiest course of action. But to give information so that you can make give about that happens, there are basically three phases of transitioning. One phase is simply dressing like the opposite sex, the sex that the individual identifies with. The second phase would be actually taking hormones of the opposite sex. Those hormones will bring about physiologic changes, although they are on the subtle side. They will not change their genitalia per se, but they may change the shape of their face, the shape of their body, where the fat deposits are in the body, the tone of their voice, and so forth. So subtle physiologic changes take place when we start taking opposite sex hormones. And then finally, some people elect to actually get the surgery that supposedly changes female genitalia into male or male into female. Now, the most common of those surgeries, I'm going to get a little graphic here, so take the children out of the room if they're young. The most common of those surgeries is male to female. Female to male is not common at all. Why? Because it's, I'm going to be blunt here, it's very difficult to build male genitalia. It's a feat of engineering. It's an incredible creation, not that female genitalia is not also, but it's just more difficult to build ma male genitalia. So to transition a woman into a man surgically requires a more complex surgery. What is done in the majority of cases, the male to female, is an orifice is created in the body and the penis is inverted into that orifice. Now, here's one of the problems that comes up with these types of surgeries. The tissues of your body have various oxygen exposures. So my tongue is in my mouth. 
If I put my tongue on the outside of my mouth, it's going to get too much oxygen exposure and there's going to be problems as a result of that, namely atrophy. What happens in these transgender surgeries is parts that are normally exposed to oxygen get inverted into the body or parts that are normally inside the body get pushed out and this causes problems, namely atrophy. Those atrophy problems generally develop about 10 years after the surgery. You know, they get worse a long time, but they get really bad 10 years after the surgery. So what basically happens is that individual may be happy with those results initially, but gradually those results are going to diminish in terms of the sexual pleasure they can enjoy and the way their organs look or whatever they get something out of, those things are gonna diminish, diminish over time. Now, it's very interesting if we look at the research on individuals that do surgically transition, what we find is there is a spike in suicidality about 10 years after the surgery. So to me, it stands to reason that just as the surgery begins to lose its effectiveness is the point where people find themselves in despair because I don't think there's anything surgically that can be done after that point. So there's a spike in suicidality. There's a generally a high level of suicidality in the transgender population, but there's a strong spike in suicidality 10 years after the surgeries. Now let's talk a little bit about why there's such a high level of suicidality in the transgender population. Many people argue because it's because of the lack of social acceptance. And I don't deny that those are some of the factors. I wouldn't want to struggle with gender identity in a public context and deal with the bullying that I would experience. And let me just make an appeal to those of us that may have hesitations, moral or otherwise, about transgenderism. Let's never be bullies. Let's always be kind and Christ-like to these people that suffer with conditions that we know nothing about. So I would not want to have to go through that. I'm sure that there's bullying as modern as our world may be and as tolerant as accepting. There are always going to be people that have an adverse reaction to that kind of thing and are going to, in response to that reaction, internally externalize in aggression. So let's be kind. Um, but what it's argued that the main reason that there's such a high level of suicidality um, in the transgender population, for instance, is because of lack of social acceptance. But what we do is we compare the levels where there might be some bullying and ostracism and marginalization with societies that have, have a much higher acceptance level for so sexual anomalies, for instance, Scandinavia. And we see the same levels. So apparently there's something within the transgender experience itself it's difficult to, you know, separate anything from the social milieu, but apparently there's something in the transgender experience itself that raises depression risk and suicidality risk. So I would just appeal to those considering surgery, whether you be a young person or an adult, make sure that you make an informed decision. Be very careful to mess with healthy organs and tissues that God has put on your body for a reason. So be very careful, very cautious, and realize that there are great risks entailed in the surgery and even in hormone dosing with opposite sex hormones. We don't know a lot about the effect that these have long-term. This is a relatively new development. And so that should be entered into with great caution. But I wanna go back to the question of children with these presentations. I feel especially strong about what we urge upon children. And what we see today is the medical community, this is my opinion in here, but what I see is not only the mental health, but the medical community urging transitioning as a solution for transgender issues. So if I identify as male and I'm female, the healthy course uh, the, the thing that is going to resolve that problem is said to be transitioning. I don't think that that gives enough time and exploration to transitioning mentally. To transition physically, first of all, is not possible. 
You cannot turn a male into a female or a female into a male, because even if you change their genitalia, they still have the DNA of the sex that they are born with. So let's not give people the illusion that they can actually fully transition. It's not possible. But can people change psychologically? The answer to that question is yes. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying there's a snap answer to it. I'm not saying it's not a profound struggle for many people. But I know people personally who did transition psychologically. They went through a period of time when they were identifying as the opposite sex. And they came to the place of accepting their biological sex. So I think that that is the easier course. And of course, with biblical data, we can see that God is capable of renewing the mind, we're told in Romans. Uh, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Be transformed by the renewing of the mind. God presents the mind as a very, if I can say it this way, renewable resource. And so that, I think, is the most, the most uh, advantageous and the healthiest course of treatment. Get counseling. There are groups that will support people that are dealing with issues like this. Connect with those groups and get help from other people, but also, first and foremost, from God in your struggle. Now, I want to go back to the question of what to do when a child presents as transgendered. What I really don't like about what's happening in the world today is a social agenda is pushing children through this process of transitioning when there really isn't enough medical research to declare that a safe endeavor. So the first step that is taken children that present as transgendered uh, prepubescent are given puberty suppressing hormones. I don't think we know enough about the long-term effect of those puberty suppressing hormones to safely urge children to take them. There are bone density issues. There are, there's potential sterility that would come as a result of taking these puberty suppressing hormones and then giving that child once they are 18, which is the age at which they can decide this, those opposite sex hormones and encouraging them to transition to me is a very risky endeavor with a lot of complex medical questions entailed and for the medical community to be urging that upon children, which I'm not saying it's done, you know, straight across the board, but for the medical community, the sectors of it that do this to urge that upon children is to, to me, I mean, could even be construed as a form of child abuse. We need to put the brakes on it, take this thing slowly and not let a social agenda force us to think one way or the other about the issue. We need to come to it objectively without political and social baggage and make an informed decision that applies to each individual in their respective situation, which each of these situations is very complex. That's where counseling comes in. You know, counselors can take in all the details of that person's complex situation and a really good counselor can provide options and uh, potential ways of moving forward that are, to me, an improvement on the status quo or what is quickly becoming the status quo. It's really great to sit down with people. I would urge parents to um, sit down with their child, parents that are dealing with this with one of their children, sit down with that child and with that child do a pros and cons. Um, help the child wrestle with what are the pros of living as a boy? What are the pros of living as a girl? What are the cons of living as a boy? The cons of living as a girl? And as much as possible, lead that child to their own decision-making process. They need a sense that they have agency, they have freedom of will, because ultimately they will become an adult and be able to make that decision themselves. So if parents come in with lots of moral pressure and spiritual pressure on the child, I'm not saying you shouldn't take a moral position on it, but if you are overly condemning on that child, overly moralistic on that child, you could do nothing more than create a pressure situation that they want to escape from. Encourage that child that they will ultimately be able to make the decision and work with them to get all the responsible information possible to be able to make that decision. And first and foremost, you know, pray with your child. I mean, parents that pray with their children 
really are creating a context in which they can bond with that child spiritually. And so pray with your children because ultimately they answer to God. You know, God created us such that our identity is designed to be grounded in physical reality. I'm very concerned about the transgender movement, if I can call it that, that urges people that who they really are is who they are internally, even if it doesn't coincide with who they are biologically. In God's way of doing things, identity is always rooted and grounded in physical reality. What we are going to do if we tell kids, you're really a boy, if you think you're a boy, is we're going to encourage people living in a state that is detached from their physical self. And that, I think, will lead to a lot of dissociation, a lot of instability. Just embracing that one idea that who I am is who I am inside, even if my physical reality is out of sync with it, that in and of itself, to me, can bring about a lot of instability. So I just want to issue a caution there, but I want to encourage people too, that God is able to reach into these complex aspects of ourselves and sort them out and straighten them out and reformat them and make them beautiful. Now, I want to say one thing in kind of in closing, and that is that I don't see all of these anomalies, transgenderism, homosexuality, as varies uh, variants on a theme. You know, some people say, well, you know, it's a rainbow. We have a rainbow of choices of how to express our gender and sexuality, and they're all good. I think the Bible is pretty clear that we are created binary and that anything that is not part of that binary configuration is a departure from God's design. But I do believe that people with transgender issues people with same-sex attraction, have unique opportunities to shine through that struggle in a way that people that don't struggle with it, that cannot shine through. And so see your, see your sexuality struggles, whether it be gender identity or attraction issues, see that as a unique opportunity that you can express you know, the way that God works in your life uniquely through that window. And so I want to encourage you, life isn't over. Find a good counselor that's compassionate, sensitive, but also principled and move forward praying and and connecting with other people, being honest with select people, not everyone, about your struggle. And we'll be praying for you as well. Thank you for letting me share my views. Thank mm-hmm. you.